Concentration is one of the five strengths. And of the strengths, it's the one that's most explicitly compared to food. It's food for your mind, food for the other factors of the path. So how do you make it strong? It depends both on what you bring to it and what you're doing while you're trying to get into concentration. What you bring to it, of course, is conviction that this is a good thing to do. And there are two ways you can use that conviction, or there are two ways in which that conviction plays out. One is to give you a sense of sangwega. You think about what happens if you don't have concentration, if you don't make your path as strong as possible. And John Lee talks about the various contemplations you can have to develop a sense of sangwega that will help the mind to settle down. It's basically a way of preparing the ground so that when you are focused on the breath, if anything else comes up, you will have seen through it. You will have developed the attitude that it's no place where you want to go back to. This is one of the functions of the contemplation of the body. You go through the 32 parts and you realize how much of your life is centered around meeting the needs of the body, how much it runs your life. And then what does it do? It gets sick. That's one of the contemplations. It goes through all the different diseases you could develop. Every part of the body has a disease that it could develop into. And as John Fun says, the disease is already there. The potential is already there, just waiting to come out. And so here we have this nest of diseases, and yet we're so attached to it. You ask yourself, isn't there something better? That's one way of giving rise to a sense of samwega. You can just look at the world around you. There seem to be periods of light, and then there are periods of darkness, and there are periods of light, and then darkness. The light never establishes itself fully. After all, this is a mixed karma bag that we've got here in the human realm. And you try to find a better realm than this, go up to the heavens, and you can stay there for a while, but then you come back down. And when you get up there, you tend to get complacent, you tend to get lazy, so you develop bad habits. And as I've said many times before, samsara is like a sick joke. You work really hard to work your way up. And then as you get higher up, you just start developing habits that will pull you back down again. Especially when you're trying to enjoy the results of your, your good actions. They pull you down. There's got to be something better. So that's one way of inducing the mind to really want to focus here, say there's got to be a way out. The other way is to give rise to a sense of joy. The Buddha talks about seeing your mind as it develops. You begin to see that as you've been practicing, unskillful habits have fallen away. You are making progress. So you look around you, you're associating with people who are observing the precepts. It's a conducive environment. People are trying to be good people. That gives rise to a sense of joy. From the joy and gladness, the mind begins to calm down. And then as it calms down, it can get into concentration. Both of those approaches, the Sangwega route and the joy route, are based on conviction that our actions really do make a difference. And we can see that as we work on developing skillful actions, we do really become more skillful. It's 
So that induces us to want to get the mind to settle down. So you focus on the breath. And here you're trying to get the mind in a state where it fills the body. Concentration is sometimes defined as jittas ekakata, singleness of mind. And that ekakata is a term that has a lot of controversy around it. He just does the term samadhi, which we translate as concentration. Ega means one. Aga is sometimes translated as point, which makes it sound like you're trying to get the mind to one point. But that doesn't fit in with the Buddha's descriptions of what he's trying to get you to do. He talks about a full body awareness. The word aga can also mean gathering place. You have one gathering place for the mind. And that does fit in with the images. So gather your mind around the breath. All your thoughts, all your directed thoughts, your evaluation, your perceptions, your attention, your intentions, bring them all right here. You might think of concentric circles all centered around one place. And John Lee does talk about focusing on one spot in the body first, what he calls the resting spots of the breath. Can be just above the navel, at the tip of the sternum, the base of the throat, tip of the nose, the palate, the middle of the head, or wherever you feel that the breath, as you breathe in, seems to come from that spot. Because after all, the breath is not the air so much coming in and out of the lungs. The air on its own wouldn't be doing anything. It's because of the breath energy in the body that the air comes in and goes out. Now, where does that energy seem to emanate from? Focus your attention there, and then notice, as the energy spreads from that spot, does it spread evenly? Does it spread smoothly? Or is it squeezed here, contorted there? Can you iron out those irregularities so that the energy as it begins to flow through the body, flows in a smooth way, a soothing way, but energizing at the same time. This is where you have to bring things into balance. The Buddhist description of how you go from mindfulness to concentration is in the seven factors for awakening. You start with mindfulness, and then you read your mind. Does the mind need gladdening, or does it need concentrating? Does it need cheering up, or does it need settling down? If it's too active, you go for the more calming factors. Calm, concentration, equanimity. If you get drowsy, and there's a tendency as things begin to calm down, you're focused on the breath, it seems very natural to fall asleep. You've got to fight that tendency. That's when you develop analysis of qualities, persistence, and rapture. Analysis of qualities, reading what's going on in the mind, trying to be as observant as possible. If you're feeling sleepy, you can ask yourself, well, how do the manifestations of sleepiness play out in the body? Where do you feel them? In other words, give yourself a question. In other words, you're taking the route that Ajahn Mahabhur talks, describes as discernment fostering concentration, where your inquisitive mind takes the lead. And as the Buddha himself said, if you don't ask questions, you're not going to get, give rise to discernment. And unwillingness to ask questions, he said, is the big obstacle to discernment. So ask some questions about what's going on where your mind is, how it relates to the body, how it relates to the breath. Look into the perceptions that you're using to visualize the breath to yourself. You can play with those perceptions, you can play with the breath. See what happens. That way in exploring, you're here 
present with the body and the breath in a way that's not going to put you to sleep. If your problem is the other side, the mind is just too active. Okay, you can ask questions, but you ask questions in a different way. You're trying to work the breath energy through the body, make it as smooth as possible, as whole as possible. And then very consciously spread your awareness to fill the whole body. And then keep watch over it to make sure that the range of your awareness doesn't shrink. And as it fills the body, try to make sure that it fills every little part of the body, each toe, each finger, the spaces between the fingers, the spaces between the toes, the different vertebrae in your back. In other words, here again, you're giving the mind work to do, but it's calming. As things feel really good inside, then you can begin to settle down. But again, you've got to monitor things carefully so that it's just right, strong, still. Not too active, not too relaxed. The people who complain about the word concentration for samadhi tend to favor the relaxed approach. You just relax yourself into concentration, develop a sense of ease, but don't try too hard. Like it is relaxing, it is easeful, but it's not strong. As the strength of concentration is meant to give rise to discernment, and the type of concentration that is strong, leading to discernment, has to have some questions inside it. and has to build on right effort, because if everything is just easy and relaxed, then you develop an easy and relaxed attitude towards your distractions. They come in a little bit, and that's okay, I'll wander with them a little bit, and then I'll come back. But that kind of concentration doesn't develop. It's the concentration where you really are trying, and you learn how to try in the right way. So yes, we are concentrating the mind, and we are trying to keep tabs on it, ride herd on it. So that quality of being centered and still and settled in is really solid. Because the more solid it is, the more you're going to see. If it's just a relaxed state. Things get blurred out. We are creating a full body awareness, but there is a sharpness to that awareness, too. So it's a balancing act. And as I've said many times before, if we're just doing one thing in one extreme, it would be easy. It would be easy to figure out. You just do, 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 or relax, relax, relax. But neither way, neither extreme gives rise to much discernment. It's when you're trying to get things balanced. That's when you have to bring your discernment to bear, and as you bring your discernment to bear in the concentration, you're getting it ready to do some work on its own. So the concentration naturally develops into discernment. This is why many times the Johns like to talk about how you can't draw a clear line between concentration and discernment. You can be emphasizing one at one point in your practice and another at the other, but they both have to be there. So work on bringing things into balance, because it's when the concentration is really balanced, that's when it's really strong. 